we now have some time for, discuss for discussion. Uh, and we have some questions uh, for each presenter. Unfortunately, Doug had to leave to attend something else and Jackie Batten, who also was involved in that part of the project will respond to those questions. But firstly, some questions for you, Denise. Can you say something about the difference between strong traditional languages and reviving traditional languages? Um, yes, certainly. Um, uh, the difference is um, in terms of um, how many, in a, in a language community, how many people speak a language. So a strong language, and we put that in inverted commas because in Australia, no Indigenous language is strong um, on the world scale or by any of those measurements. But in a strong um, language in Australia, then um, most people in that language community would speak it. Children, um, babies would hear it from birth and would grow up speaking it. That would be the um, kind of context. Whereas for reviving language or um, reawakening language, and there's a long line of um, different contexts that people are working in to strengthen and to reawaken their languages, um, it means that um, there will be fewer speakers, perhaps you know, only older people speaking it. And so um, we, you would be looking at trying to reinstate a language um, in the intervening generations, or it might even be that a community is working to revive, um, sorry, to reawaken their language from archival sources, um, which is why I quoted that long, hard road to hoe, because that clearly involves quite a long process. I hope that helps. Thank you. And another one for you, Denise. What is the ecology where people speak standard Australian English and or Aboriginal English, Englishes? as first or main languages and are only starting to learn some of their traditional languages. Yes, I probably should have said something, I suppose, in my nervousness, um, if that was you, Sarah. Um, yeah, um, yes, I should have said something about, um, we are, this is a very first step, um, positing these um, language ecologies. And the reason why they are so basic is that, um, as Francis pointed out, we have such poor language data at this point in time on so many of these um, languages. And so we've taken um, the approach of having three very broad ones. And so um, in the English is dominant, you'll notice that I use the plural, um, the English is dominant language ecology, um, that would be the one. Um, and because it implies that you would be reawakening a traditional language. And we've used the catch-all phrase Englishes because the, um, the, um, we have not much distinguishing um, data research, um, distinguishing Aboriginal Englishes that are very close to standard Australian English versus those that are distant. So it's, it's a little bit tricky at the moment. Um, the same thing goes for all those categories. But as, if you can think about them as very broad ones, as a first step on our way to differentiating language policy, policies and therefore services that we can put into the languages domain, um, that would be very helpful, I hope. Thanks, Denise. And now, Jackie, some questions for you uh, about the NILS data. A couple of people have asked if we can access NILS data at the state level. Yeah, Is it broken so, down per state? Um, so the results of the uh, the NILs will be published online, um, probably in the coming months. Um, and uh, you'll be able to see a, a map of all of Australia with all of the languages. Um, so we don't break it down by state level. Um, that can actually be quite a, a tricky task because um, the, the boundaries of languages don't uh, fit neatly into the state. Um, in uh, the state boundaries. Um, so we don't break it down by state, but you can have a look at all of the languages that were surveyed um, in the state that you're interested in um, when that comes online. Um, and uh, I think there was also a question um, from uh, Britt who asked about um, the, the data and whether IATSIS will be providing that to the Productivity Commission. Um, so the, the data will be available for all to see. And if you would like um, more data than, than will be what will be available online, then you can um, get in touch with IATSIS and um, probably Doug or Casey will be able to help you with that. Okay. And some questions for you, Francis. Um, in the Natsis language use data, why does it sta say standard Australian English is L1? Where do Aboriginal Englishes come? 
Um, I'd have to actually go back and double check, but my recollection is that um, Natsis recognises Aboriginal English is very poorly and that um, they, I, th I think it's unclear actually. I think it's going to depend on how individual survey respondents interpret the questions. Um, so that's not a very satisfactory answer, but when I alluded to some of the problems with um, the official statistics and the kind of data holdings that we have, that's one of them, is that Aboriginal Englishers tend to get fairly poor recognition in some of these data holdings. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is a question also about the NATSIS data. Is there anything on teaching ESL for Aboriginal children? Um, I don't think so in the NATSIS data. There is in the longitudinal study of Indigenous children um, but we didn't have the opportunity to delve into that um, particular issue for this survey. Mm -hmm. And I think you've responded to Karina for this one, but maybe you'd share that with all of us. I'm not reading as quickly perhaps as everyone else. The question about where does remote South Australia sit? So I might have, um, in my haste to kind of cover a lot of ground, I might not have been particularly clear about this, but there are a couple of regions such as outer regional Queensland and remote South Australia that didn't get classified into either language ecology area in our um, paper. And that was because of um, the way that the ABS kind of provided geographical breakdowns of their survey data. They had um, essentially in their efforts to ensure confidentiality and privacy they grouped together areas with really diverse language ecologies, which made us really uncomfortable classifying those areas one way or another. So when we provided those language ecology breakdowns, we just excluded a couple of those areas like remote South Australia. So they are present in the full sample, but not in those language ecology area samples. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a comment here about um, the, the bad policy implications simply being institutional racism and the need to call that for what it is. Yep, absolutely. Also for you, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say, I absolutely agree. And you know, there's both, I think, what this points towards is both um, direct interpersonal racism, as well as institutional racism, for example, um, in the police or in other service areas that aren't set up to deliver services to people in the languages that they speak. Yeah. And also to you, Francis, in terms of social and emotional wellbeing, was there much difference in the data between males and females? And was there data for communities reclaiming or revitalising languages and their social and emotional well-being? Um, so on the first question, uh, we didn't actually break down this, uh, the results in this survey by gender. Um, we, we probably could have, but I think that was just a decision we made in the interest of keeping what was already quite a long report short. So I don't know, but it would be possible to find out and it's quite an interesting question. Um, on the social and emotional well-being questions, the strongest connection, uh, strongest correlations related to um, what the ABS called positive emotional well-being. So that's people reporting um, that they frequently feel um, happy, full of energy, full of life and those kind of things. And that um, was the case uh, in both language ecology areas. So I think the answer to that second question is yes. Uh, and I think uh, for you, Jackie, if you want to just say um, your answer to this again, when the survey comes online, will we be able to access more detailed data in different areas? An example given here was, for example, in the Western Desert. Yep, so the, uh, the data that will be available will be um, according to um, uh, what uh, language variety is named in um, the responses that we received. So we received um, lots of different responses for Western Desert varieties and so you'll be able to see all of those different ones um, and it's a great question because uh, while we do classify um, the western desert as 
um, a whole as strong um, or relatively strong, there are um, uh, varieties of Western desert that are at a much more critical level of endangerment. So you'll be able to see all of that. Uh, a comment here, currently there is no national database for ESL learners, nor Indigenous ESL learners. I think that's a comment, not a question. I'm so sorry, Carmel. I was just um, feeding back to Lynn um, and to everybody about ah, that, about okay. her question. I beg your pardon. <laughs> yes. No, that's okay. Yep. So that's a, a comment. Thank you. Uh, we have a few more minutes for questions or comments, if anyone else would like to join. And forgive me for not calling the names of the people who are putting them. I'm, I can't read that fast. So 